All right, everybody, dear participants in the Vucera Summer Program on Legal Technology and Operations, dear members of the faculty, uh, dear friends of Vucera Law School that you've made it here tonight. Um, this afternoon, it's my great pleasure to briefly introduce Professor Mirelle Hildebrand. She's a research professor at the Law, Science, Technology and Society Research Group at Freie Universität Brussels. And since 2011, she holds the part-time chair for uh, smart Environments, Data Protection, and the Rule of Law at the Institute for Computing and Information Sciences at Radboud University Nijmegen in the Netherlands. Her research focuses on the interface between law and technology with a particular interest in the effects of smart technology and in particular machine learning here on the substance uh, of fundamental legal rights. She has written extensively on this matter. She has published several books. I'm sure many of you have looked her up. So it's not going to be news if I tell you that she has a massive thing out there that's called Cubicle. It stands for Counting as a Human Being in the Era of Computational Law. That is supported substantially by the European Research Council um, and deals with both artificial intelligence or data-driven law based on machine learning and cryptographic or code-driven law based on blockchain technologies. Uh, there are positions open there, so if anyone, if you're interested, I encourage you to have a look at the website. We'll have the website up later on and send you information after the lecture. Tonight, Mary is here with, the, uh, with us, and as the title has probably given away, she will speak for us a lot to statistics or vice versa. Mireille, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think you have spent an afternoon um, having statistics speak to law. Um, so the vice versa is there. I don't have to do that. Um, and maybe I'll turn it around. But I will also explain why I think that statistics talking to law uh, is a very good thing, depending on how it is done. So I'm going to base the talk today on a book I wrote, published some years ago, which goes into the relationship between smart technologies and law specifically the rule of law. And when I refer to smart technologies, I refer to technologies that anticipate what we do based on our behavioral data. <clears throat> More specifically, I will uh, build on two articles. The first one is the paper from the Chorley Lecture that I gave at the Law School of Economics. It's a lecture organized by the Modern Law Review which was about law as information. And uh, another paper uh, which I gave at a conference in um, Toronto, at Toronto University, law as computation. We're getting closer to the subject. Um, in the meantime, I got this wonderful ERC advance grant for a research into computational law. This is the website. Um, uh, the the uh, project will actually start beginning of next year, but I'll be looking for the right people, sheep with about seven, eight legs, to do this. Because I'm looking for lawyers who actually dare to admit that they like mathematics, not necessarily that they do mathematics or have a degree in it, but lawyers who are not afraid of it and they're actually curious about it, what it does. Um, and preferably a, a background in uh, philosophy. Because I think one of the important things that has to happen to the practice of computational law, and also the construction, because this is clearly something that is under construction, uh, is to th start theorizing it, to start looking at the assumptions. Computational law for me is two very different things, artificial intelligence, machine learning, etc data-driven law, I call that, and on the other hand, code-driven law, or, or making things legal by design, self-executing code, which is now hyping under the banners of blockchain, but it existed long before that, and I think it will even survive uh, blockchain applications. And if you want to see irony in those words, uh, you're very welcome. Um, so when you look at the quote that is on top of the website, 
that's also the quote with which I opened uh, the project application, you will see that I think that computation and its um, not equivalent, but uh, let's say there is a family resemblance between computation and counting and ranking and digitizing and datifying. I'm, I'm going to use that for now interchangeable. That it's important and that it's interesting that it can give us new insights, but that my default position is, the default position of the project, that not everything that counts, and that is of course in a different meaning of the word, can be counted, and not everything that can be counted actually count. It all depends. Um, and that, I think, in itself makes all this very interesting. <clears throat> From a computer science perspective, I think that the datification and the tendency to believe that if you do something data-driven, that it's probably very good and better and outperforming human beings, that it easily falls into the trap of what has been called somewhere after the Vietnam War, the McNamara fallacy, you can Google that later at home. The first step in that fallacy is to datify whatever can easily be datified. Well, that's okay, so far as it goes. The second step is to disregard what you cannot datify, or to give it an arbitrary or average or other synthetic quantitative value. This is artificial and misleading. Now there is a sub-discipline in computer science that works on synthetic data. I'm not saying that that is artificial and misleading. Law itself, I would say, is artificial. So the fact that something is artificial certainly doesn't mean that it is misleading. But if you're, just because you can't get your hand on the data that you need, going to use other data or make data up, that is of course misleading. The third step is to presume that what can't be datified easily can't be important. That is blindness. And the fourth step is to say that what can't be easily datified really doesn't exist. And that is suicide. And here is the reference to the person who said this. And the slides will be um, provided, of course. Now, that was the computer science perspective. That's what I believe any data scientist will agree with. Now, let's look at the other side to take the law perspective. And let's then start from the output of artificial legal intelligence. So the output that is soon, I'm absolutely convinced, going to inform a lot of the legal knowledge that we are going to manage. Now, I believe from the perspective of law that outcome must be contestable because that's the difference between law and, for instance, administration. But to be contestable, this particular type of knowledge has to be testable because of all the computation that goes on in the back end of these systems. It must be contestable. And some people think that's just a matter of making it all open source. But it's much more than that, and open source doesn't always help. Maybe it's good to already say that <coughs> one of the problems of open source is that it has to be maintained all the time. Same with black, uh, blockchain. So if you create a layer that has to be maintained, basically voluntary, depending, but maybe not by yourself if you're using it, you're making yourself dependent. Um, there is another story that is now being repeated by many lawyers, uh, triggered by the General Data Protection Regulation, Article 20, I think, 22, on the transparency that is required for automated decisions. And there is a very interesting discussion going on whether that means and if so, what that means, 
that the output of this system must be explainable, as one of the recitals of the GDPR says. Now, I want to take the discussion away from the question whether the algorithms that have produced the output, whether they are explainable, back to the research design itself, to the first step, because I think that will give more of an insight than trying to open the black box. Like somebody said today, human beings are the ultimate black box. And that is absolutely a fact. And I think that is something we have to remember. Um, and that is precisely why we have law. We have to give reasons. If the court sentences you to 20 years imprisonment and you ask why, and he says, well, first of all, I had a row with my wife. After that, breakfast was very bad. Then I had all these other suspects, which I don't like. You came last. I don't like the color of your hair. <clears throat> so that's why I gave you 20 years. You will say, well, I'm not interested. This is not valid reasoning, right? Schluss. So in the law, we're not interested in that explanation. We're not interested in what goes on in the brains of the judge. Law is meant to constrain to the extent that it's possible. We should not exaggerate that. What the court can decide. That's the role of the law to constrain what a court can decide. Now, if we want to figure out how the output of data-driven regulation or law or other types of legal tech that are data-driven, how that actually works from the perspective of law, we will have to develop a new legal hermeneutics. Hermeneutics means, I'm just curious, who of you know what is hermeneutics? When I say hermeneutics, who of you say, oh yeah. Oh, good question I asked, right? <laughs> so hermeneutics is an expensive term, but it's about interpretation. So the idea is that law is text-driven, as we know it huh? so far still. It's text-driven. So a legislator has written down text and enacted it, or a court has spoken and the verdict has been um, out there 20 years later, maybe 80 years later, that text is going to be interpreted. Somebody has to decide what it means in a specific case. That's what we call interpretation, and hermeneutics says that the act of interpretation and more than an individual act of me, it's a practice of interpretation, which is what you learn at high school, is what makes law. We know that natural language is ambiguous. We want to establish legal certainty, but not legal rigidity. So this is something we are used to, but that's all text-driven. And we're now moving to another era, and we have to think about how to decipher the potential of legal meaning of a specific output. And we have to learn, therefore, to differentiate between correlations, explanations, and justification. So what, just for a minute, referring back to the GDPR, what if a decision maker says, well, I figured out why the algorithm decided that you're not getting a loan? There are these three features weighing so much that determine that. Are you supposed to accept that? No. You want a justification. Actually, in the example that I'm giving, the justification might be the freedom to contract. But it's never the case that there is no justification in law. And the freedom to contract is constrained. Anti-discrimination law, uh, unfair practices, et cetera, et cetera. With the government, of course, it's even more simple. Uh, we have the legality principle. So you have to always justify your decision in terms of reasons that the law recognizes as justifications. So we may be black boxes, but that doesn't matter. That's why we have the law. 
So let's not now give it to an algorithm and then say, oh, but we are black boxes also, so it doesn't matter. That's not an argument. Let's look at uh, law as information then at the relationship between information and computation, talk a bit about artificial legal intelligence, and then end with uh, discussing speaking law to statistics and vice versa. So when you go into the etymology and the history of the concept of information, um, there are two meanings. The oldest meaning is the second meaning. It comes from informare. That means you are forming, you are shaping something. You have an impact on something that is actually constitutive for that something. It changes that something. You could say that uh, when one thing is informed by another thing, and that is often the case, that we're talking in that second meaning. Later, long after antiquity, and also how we usually talk about, or very often talk about information, it is in another meaning. It's information about something. It's a sort of transfer of content from one point to another, communication. Um, now I'm going to say something about speech act theory because it's extremely relevant for the law. Um, I'll try to keep that short. When you're, you're discussing information about something, speech act theory calls that an illocutionary act. If I say my brother got married yesterday and give you information about his marriage. How interesting. Well, you don't know my brother, so maybe it's not interesting at all, but still, it's an example. Besides that, he didn't get married yesterday, man. Now, if I say, and I'm a civil servant, I declare thee husband and wife, I'm not describing something. I'm doing something. And that's called a performative act. So that means that we do things with words. The law attributes legal consequence, legal effect, to that statement. So that's a very different way of talking about information. But if you talk about legal information, you can talk in the first sense about all kinds of legal knowledge, like libraries of legal texts, statutes, treaties, uh, case law, doctrine, etc., etc. And you can even manage that. So you can put it in a certain order. You can make decision trees. You can categorize it. That's managing information about the law. How fantastic. But there's something else. As lawyers, we all know that positive law is informed by legislation, case law, and doctrine, while at the same time, positive law informs legislation, case law, and doctrine. They're mutually constitutive. You can't disentangle them. It's not causality. It's not causality. But it's also not a description. It's not management of knowledge or something like that. <coughs> And you can frame that, if you want, by saying that legal conditions inform legal effect. So that's the performative understanding of uh, information under law. So you can say law informs us about the legal effect of our actions. A computer can understand that. But a lawyer understands that law informs the consequences of our actions. If I take a person to the city hall and register a marriage, and then that marriage gets declared, and I fulfill all the legal conditions, then there is that legal effect. That means, depending on the jurisdiction, that if I make a debt, my husband's assets will be liable for that. Real effects. Now I'm going to quote you, continuously continuing the thought that law is about consequences, 
very real consequences. I'm going to quote uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, the, uh, one of the legal realists, Supreme Court judge in the United States. In one of his works, he said, for the rational study of the law, the black letter man may be the man of the present, women were then, I don't know, but the man of the future is the man of statistics and the master of economics. So many people say Holmes foresaw this computational law stuff. Holmes also said, the life of the law is not logic, but experience. So you can see statistics, economics, and you can here see the concept of learning. Learning is about experience. Changing your behavior because of the feedback that you get. That's learning, that's experience. That also means that law is something that develops. It never stands still. And then the saying that we probably all know from Holmes because it's always quoted, he said, the prophecies of what the courts will do in fact, and nothing more pretentious is what I mean with law. And many people quote him as having said, what the courts do in fact is what I mean with the law. But that's of course not true. That would be a meaningless thing to say, because the reason why you are studying law and why we have to study, why it's an academic study and we need so much time, is because we are trying to anticipate what the court will say. And we're never sure about that. That's what makes law interesting. If you are sure, you're not gonna go to court, right? So the law is always about an anticipation, about uh, an uncertainty. Because there are many connections between that um, a position that Holmes took, uh, I think now, a hundred years ago or more, and this, the, the arrival of computational law, Ian Kerr from Ottawa University, Toronto, said what Holmes actually says is that all this prediction stuff, all these statistics is important so that those that are subject to law can foresee the consequences of their actions. It's not meant that those who are trying to subject others to the law, that they can predict how these others are going to act. That's not the function of the law. The function of the law is that we are under the rule of law and that we can sort of foresee when I hit you or when I buy something and I don't pay, I can sort of foresee the consequences and in the end they will be enforceable. So this brings me to, um, to the question, what is law? There's a famous German legal historian, Uwe Wesel, who said, trying to define law is like trying to nail a pudding to the wall. <coughs> blah, blah, blah. So many people who try to think about what is law, why is law something different from ethics, for instance? Why is it nice to talk about ethics, but at some point you have to accept that ethically we're not going to agree. We're not going to agree. <clears throat> Rappel was one of the legal philosophers who said, because about moral issues we will not agree, we have to make sure on which point we will legally agree, because that will be enforceable. Um, so, Radbruch took a side way to say what law does. I would frame it like that, not what law is, because then you go into the metaphysics, but what does it actually do? And he says law has to negotiate, to navigate three core goals. And as soon as law leaves one of those goals as not interesting, is no longer striving for that goal. We don't have law, but we have, for instance, administration or morality um, or dictatorship or policy. So he said the first goal is justice. And with justice, he defined simply as treating equal cases equally 
to the extent that they are equal. Uh, it's a bit more complex than that, but let's not go into that. So the, the concept of equality, he says, is core to law. But the question is always, um, where does this equality start? So if I sentence you to 20 years imprisonment, I have to sentence you also to 20 years because if it's the same case. But why 20, why not 30 or 15? The equality argument does not yet give an answer to that. The second important thing about law that differentiates it from morality is legal certainty. And he defined legal certainty in terms of equality, yeah, that, that gives you certainty. Equal cases treated equally gives you certainty. You know if the courts have decided like this in that case, then they will have to decide like this in this case. But it's also the positiveness of law, the fact that ultimately there is uh, the monopoly of violence that is connected with law. And the third goal is the instrumentality of law. So governments develop a policy, and law is one of the tools they have, one of the instruments. And a big challenge for the law is to play around with these three goals, not let any of them go, but accept that in practice, in particular instances, they're incompatible. And you will have to make decisions. Now, this idea of law actually means that law enables subjects, those that are subject to law, to speak law to power. So based on these three goals, you have a handle. Now let's move towards um, information and computation. So I've, I've spoken about the, the concept of information that, that is familiar with us, because we are text-driven. This is a text-driven science. Hmm? Now let's move to computer science, where there's a totally different assumption about what information is. Um, and let's very briefly look at one of the founding fathers of that concept of information, which was Shannon, who worked during the Second World War on encryption. That means that he, his task was to transfer certain contents, certain information from point A to point B and he wanted exactly the same information that was sent from point A to arrive in point B. And he wanted only Mr. B to receive that information and nobody else. And this is the war, you can imagine. So his concept of information is discrete. So sequences of symbols, that's how he defines information. Then he's focused on transfer as fast as possible. We're in war from A to B, hiding the content from unauthorized receivers, making sure the content is reproduced at B identically to how it was at A. <coughs> His concerns were speed, integrity, and confidentiality. And one of his main concerns, which relates to speed, is to send as little signals as possible, because then you can send much more information. So actually his concern was compression. Information for Shannon is compression. So he wanted to send only the information that is surprising, anything we already know, or we could calculate, don't send it, it's not necessary. So if I have a book, if I have text, and I remove all the vowels from that text, and I have a machine on the other side that can infer the text, then I don't have to send the vowels. That, that sort of compression he was thinking about. The second founding father of computer science, artificial intelligence, actually he coined the term cybernetics, was Wiener. So, one of the things that Wiener said is, well, information is not a substance. It's not something tangible. It's not matter. It's not energy. Hmm? What makes information information is that it gives you feedback. 
in a situation where you may have to act. So you want to know how your environment is going to respond to your action. So you're going to experiment and figure that out. <clears throat> so his information concept was that of feedback. Finally, Herbert Simon, another founding father of uh, computer science, artificial intelligence, and also the um, scientist that um, for the first time talked about human rationality as bounded rationality. So, so the problem that you, you can calculate, our conscious mind can deliberate, but that capacity is actually very, very small. So he said, what our brains are doing all the time is um, pattern recognition. And uh, pattern recognition is, of course, the kind of patterns that are important for one agent are not important for another agent. There's a famous little essay, little book by Thomas Nagel, Seeing Like a Bat. So I see that wall. I'm not going to walk into it. A bat doesn't see that wall, but he hears it, right? Because he has this echo sound. He's also not going to fly in it. But he sees totally different patterns than I do. So the patterns that you detect in your environment to navigate it are agent dependent. And it means um, that Simon measured information in terms of adaptive profile. Are you able to catch the right patterns to move on, uh, to make the right decisions about how to act? And of course, most of those decisions are made by your brains without your necessary attention. Just imagine if my autonomic nervous system would ask me, look, you're going to give a presentation, you'll need to be a bit upbeat, should I raise your heartbeat? Imagine if my autonomic system would ask me that and all the other related questions about breathing and know that all, we have actually no access to that. In that sense, we are definitely um, black boxes to ourselves. Not just others are black boxes to us, we are black boxes to ourselves in that sense. Now let's have a look at um, one particular type of artificial legal intelligence um, and that is information retrieval that can be uh, search. So you can ask a machine to go and search for the relevant legislation, treaties, case law, doctrine, the canonical sources of the law, for instance, via the internet, you can give it access, and it's, it functions as a sort of agent then. You can do e-discovery, e-evidence, uh, trying to situate the relevant facts, and it can even do argumentation, mining, developing uh, analog an analogous reasoning and different interpretation techniques, extensive interpretation, systematic, teleological, well, we know. Now, what basically these systems do is they read an enormous amount of text for us. Just imagine that you want to know positive law at the federal level in Germany, and that would mean that you have to read all the case law with respect to a particular problem, all the relevant legislation, uh, whether acts of parliament or whatever. Actually, as we have already heard this afternoon, that would be totally impossible. For these types of machines, that is not impossible. They are able to just run through all that. And there is a, um, a famous scholar of the digital humanities, Franco Moretti, who has named what these machines do distant reading. So we are used to close reading as lawyers. We take a judgment and we try to analyze it in great detail and look at everything that is relevant. Close reading, not talking about poetry, but about very interesting legal text. What these machines do is distant reading, or you could say, they allow us to do distant reading. So there is a techni technology tool in between. Now, my conclusion from that is 
We are used to text-driven interpretation. That is our trait, that is our skill. If we want to survive, if we want the law and the rule of law to survive data-driven systems, data-driven legal texts, we will have to learn how to interpret what they come up with. And with interpret, I don't mean, oh, the machine says this. Okay. And since somebody told me that it's outperforming top lawyers, I don't have to investigate anymore. I can just take that for granted and go and do it. Interpretation would mean that you know to ask the right questions to the right people about to what extent those results make sense and how you could apply them to your own case. What other questions you want to ask. Now, let's move a step on from information retrieval to quantified legal prediction, data-driven law. So this is, of course, what comes in a newspaper or other magazines, 79% uh, accuracy. And it might be interesting to ask a group of lawyers to make the same prediction and to ask a group of lay people to make the same prediction and then to compare that. And then after that, you can say, oh, see, the machines are outperforming the lawyers, not the lay people. They get it right. Sometimes that happens. What I want to do is to not look at the newspaper article, but to read the scientific article that has uh, presented this study to see what, what is actually happening. So the first assumption that the people who write that article, the first assumption that is there is that text extracted from published judgments can stand as a crude proxy for applications lodged with the court. There are many more applications lodged than the ones over which we have a published judgment, right? So this assumption is not real. It's an assumption. So here we have the first gap. Now, why would they use this? Why would they use published judgment if there is so much else? Well, the answer is very simple. That's the low-hanging fruit. That's what there is. That's what you can get your hands on. Second good argument is everybody can look at it. That means you have basically your, your training data is public data. But still, there is an assumption there which we should not forget. Now, one of the problems with that assumption is that the authors in their research make a difference between the facts of the case and the law, and they make conclusions based on that. But anybody who is a lawyer knows that when a court writes its judgment, it will frame the facts in such a way that they agree with the conclusion. You'd be crazy not to do that. And you can frame the same facts in many different ways. That means that this assumption that the published verdict is a good proxy for everything that happened before is very problematic. Very problematic. So your training data is actually not the right data that you need. Now I'm not saying they should have done something else, I'm just saying that based on that, when you draw conclusions, you have to go back to this point and remember what happened. They also um, admit or admit, say upfront, that cases that were held inadmissible or struck out beforehand, even before the inadmissibility decision, they are not reported. So they can't play a role. They are not part of the training data. Um, of course, because you couldn't do a text-based analysis of these cases. Again, this is the low-hanging fruit problem. Now, we don't know whether these cases would make a difference or not, but probably they would, because it, there is a reason why they were thrown out. Third point. 
depict only cases related to Article 3, 6, and 8. So that's um, uh, prohibition of inhuman and degrading treatment, fair trial, and privacy. Well, they had a reason for that. It provided the most data to be scraped. This is an interesting terminology. We never talk about how, how did you scrape your, your case law yesterday? That's not the way lawyers talk, but for a data scientist that is normal way to talk, hmm? scraping. Um, and sufficient cases for each. Hmm? They, they want to have something that is significant, that is meaningful, so they must have a kind of a minimum. Now, if you know the case law of the court in Strasbourg, you know that usually uh, the applicant will say there is a violation of this and there is a violation of that and that huh? to, to have subsidiary uh, complaints. That means that these different violations are connected. They are not independent variables. Um, this goes notably for Articles 5, 7, 9, 10, and 14, which are very often presented together with uh, 3, 6, and 8. So this has an impact, again, on the framing. OK. Data set is publicly available because of the choice they made. Um, they um, took for each article so, so they're interested in violations of that article, yes or no. They took for each article all cases, apart from non-English judgments. Here we go again. Equal amount of violation, non-violation cases. Um, text extraction by using regular expression, excluding operative provisions. So there is some cleansing happening, maybe some labeling. Uh, so the data set being legal text is being curated before it goes in. Now, as said, there is a lot of availability bias here that will work through to the conclusion. How did they actually do this? This is natural language processing. So they um, worked with a bag of words model. So they did not look in at the grammar, at syntax, uh, word order they didn't look at, uh, but they looked at sets of words uh, and to compare how these sets of words correlate with violation, non-violation <coughs> across the cases that they had. They also worked with topics. They tried to cluster semantically similar engrams, uh, assuming that similar words will occur in similar contexts. Um, the slide deck is going to be there. Uh, I'm going to move on. Prediction is defined as a binary classification task. Yes or no violation. Um, and here we have some nice stats where you can see um, how the system actually starts predicting based on which factors. Have a look at it later on. Now, the authors conclude circumstances and topics are the best predictors combined. The two combined works best. And then they come with the conclusion that law, ha law has a low performance. Though we must remember that in case of inadmissibility, there is no law section. Um, in the discussion part of their paper, they say facts are much more important than law. That's their conclusion. And I would say that, oh, sorry, not I would say, they conclude that legal realism and legal formalism are confirmed by their research. They actually say that this is evidence that legal realism is realistic. Now, I think that's nonsense for at least two reasons. One, as they, they're very open about that, and I think if we would discuss with them, they would immediately agree. The facts are formulated by the courts in their data set. 
and are probably tuned to the outcome. <coughs> and in many of the cases, they actually took as training data in admissibility cases, for instance. There was no law section, so that naturally it cannot count. Now, why am I dissecting this um, experiment, this study? I think this study is very interesting and we can learn all sorts of things <coughs> from that study. But the first thing we must learn is that the output, the conclusion, everything is under discussion as long as you look at what data did they train on. How did they validate? Did they do out of sample testing? No, not yet. What, have they, what is the evidence actually? A new hermeneutics for lawyers would mean that we can have that conversation with um, the developers of that system. Now, one of the arguments that is often given against this is that if you want to have really good artificial intelligence, you will have a black box. There are three reasons behind this opacity argument. Very often the software is <coughs> proprietary or used for security, national security measures by governments. That's intentional concealment. The second point is that we teach our children from when they're very young to read and write. It takes about half a year, one year, for a child's brains to have been trained to do that. And that training period means that the morphology of your brains, so the form, the shape of the neurons, changes. And your brain behavior changes. So we put an enormous amount of effort to get bookish, text-driven brains. Now, many people will say we're not wired for statistics, but we're also not wired for text. We're not wired for text. I think if we want democracy, if we want good law, we will have to get wired. We have to get ourselves wired for statistics. And I'm not saying that we should all become statisticians or computer scientists. No, but we'll have to get training in that enough to be able to question things. The third reason behind this opacity argument is a mismatch between mathematical optimization and human semantics. I think that's a bigger problem. Uh, there's a real gap there. Uh, if you think that human beings are computational machines, then you will think that it's not a problem. But I have put up front the statement that not everything that counts can be counted. So I'm not of that school. I do not have a computational theory of the mind. However attractive it is to build a theory of the mind based on the latest technology. You can see that in the history we always frame our minds and ourselves in line with the latest technology. We're doing that now again. I think there is a mismatch between our speech and text driven way of being in the world, way of constituting society and mathematical optimization. Um, but that's, I think, in itself not a problem as long as it's recognized and as long as we learn how to interact with that um, mathematics. There is, um, as, as part of, of these arguments that these machines are black boxes and that we should accept that, uh, better a good decision than an decision that can be explained. That's a bit the mantra. Now, I want to refute that. I think that's not correct. This is usually framed as the ac accuracy interpretability trade-off. Um, Let's look at an article written by uh, Rich Caruana and others, Microsoft Research, where they tried, this is an example from medical science, where they tried to develop a POD, prediction of, prediction of death, 
for people with pneumonia in order to advise general practitioners or physicians or whatever you call it, whether to treat them at home or uh, hospitalize them. So here you see the training data, uh, the validation set, the split. So basically they took about 14,000 records from Runomia patients with 46 features. They divided it 70-30 into a training set where the algorithm learned and the other 30% they used to validate the findings and maybe to fine tune. Well, here come the results. First, asthma negatively correlates with death from pneumonia. Second, chest pain negatively correlates with death of pneumonia. And prior heart problems correlate negatively with death from pneumonia. There was high accuracy. Accuracy was very high. The, so the idea is that the algorithm did very well and was very certain. <coughs> But when they showed it to medical specialists, they say, oh my God, never ever give this to physicians because it's getting things entirely wrong. That is of course not very surprising. Can somebody immediately see why that is not a surprise? Why, yes, the algorithm has very high accuracy on this data set, but it's getting reality very wrong. Yeah. If it's only looking at that from, from both, yeah, it could be that they fly from other countries. Oh, because they are pre That's the reason why they die from Yes. I, I think that uh, they, they can cut that out, sort of. They will look very specifically at that. So th this was not the problem, actually. So I forgot the statistical term. Yeah. Uh, I know, but if I have asthma, um, or probably might hurt my, like, I got pain here, I may go see a doctor. Um, that might provide me from dying from pneumonia. Yes, exactly. So actually it's even one step further because physicians know that you're high risk with these three factors, they will immediately send you to the hospital. And that means your chance to die becomes lower than from other people. So they checked for that, they figured that out. Now, what is the interesting point? The interesting point that in this case, they used a machine learning application that gave the features. It didn't come out with a score. It didn't say, this person has nine out of 10 chance to die. This person has three out of 10. And we don't know why, because it's a neural net, it's a black box, but it's absolutely high accuracy. So believe me, hmm? they used another type of system, which means that they came up with these features. And that means, that you could interpret what the system did and say, oh, wow, that's hilarious. That's actually a statistician would say it's a very stupid research design. Hmm? You could look at it from that perspective too. Now, what my point is, in this case, it's very clear, but there are many other cases where it's not so easy to empirically immediately see where the system gets things wrong especially if it only gives you a score. But now think of law. Think of law where you're, you're talking about complexity and about enormous amounts of information, enormous amounts of case law, enormous amounts of legislation which might be sometimes slightly contradictory, etc. doctrine. Hmm? Why are you asking the machine to do distant reading here? Because you can't do it, right? So the machine comes up high accuracy with a result. How are you going to figure out whether the machine is getting it wrong or right? And what is the meaning of wrong and right here? We're not talking about medical science, about yes, somebody died, no, somebody didn't die. We're talking about, is this the right decision? And we're talking about right in the simple sense of what the court would have done, hmm? positive law. But we have as lawyers a normative 
expectation of rightness, not in the sense of morality, we're not into morality, that's for the ethicists, hmm? but positive law has an anticipation towards what is right, considering the law. Okay, now let's go back to machine learning. This is all about machine learning. Let's look at what machine learning actually is. And I always like to quote the uh, definition of Tom Mitchell, um, who said, who wrote in his handbook, a computing program is said to learn from experience E with respect to some class of tasks, T and performance metric P, if its performance at tasks in T as measured by P, improves with experience E. This is poetry, right? All the extra knowledge or sentences or blah, blah has been removed. This is very sec what a machine does when it learns. The politics here is in who gets to determine E, T, and P, because that makes all the difference. The ethics is in how have you determined that, with what uh, goals. And the law, of course, is concerned with the contestability. Can I ask, can I have your training data? Can I see how you split training and validation data? Can you show me your out of sample testing? How many performance metrics did you test? Six. Why did you only show me two? Ah, because those two both give you 84% and 87% accuracy, but the other four give you 33, 45, and 62%. This is about contestability. So, very practically speaking, the example I gave, the training set is patient data, usually clinical data. Uh, in our case, it would be legal text. The task would be to predict death of pneumonia, in our case, for instance, to predict a judgment, um, and the performance metric is to percentage correct prediction of death within 30 days, or the percentage of correctly predicted judgments. Now, this correctly, huh? does it predict correctly? That is what, in this type of machine learning, is called the so-called ground truth. When I was collaborating with computer scientists in a, a project, um, I'm a philosopher and one of my postdocs also, we looked at each other, ground truth? Have we come to the, to the moment when you can grind the truth? So she's still putting this coffee mill. Of course, we know that it has nothing to do with that, but it's a very interesting thing. So ground truth means what is the truth on the ground, out there, not in the data set, but outside the data set. Because we don't live in data sets, we live in atoms. So you could say that machine learning actually parasites on ground truth. Now in the case of medical specialists, but also in the case of lawyers, the experts will not agree on the ground truth. They will often disagree. That is why we have courts to cut the knot at a certain point. But that simple fact that we're here talking about things that the experts disagree about already raises the whole problem of, okay, you need a ground truth, yes, otherwise you can't test. But let's not forget that to some extent that ground truth is a fiction. What if we have an interpretation by a radiologist. And we have four radiologists, and they have different interpretations, but we can't work with that. So we say, you know what, one of them I don't like because he's always an outlier, so we don't listen to that guy. Um, and that one, yeah, well, it's nearly the same, so we take the average of the other three. Then we're already having gaps and assumptions that are not working, and often that has to happen. A data scientist will know exactly what he's doing, or she, and will take that into account. But I'm so very worried that a consultant who has to sell a program 
is not going to say that he put four performance metrics that were scoring low in the drawer. Why should he? Because nobody will buy it, right? So that is why I believe that lawyers must come to understand enough of this to not be taken for a ride. So quickly about experience. Machines have experience, yes. Uh, but data is not the same as what it is a trace of or what it refers to. So there is the data here and there is reality there. It's never the same. So if you solve a problem in the data, you might have solved a computational artifact in the data that is not out there in the real world. We have the problem of low-hanging fruit, of p-hacking, trying to train on the same data set in different ways until you get high accuracy. Data dredging, it's also called. So from a methodological perspective, there should be like, in the, under the rule of law, we have some sort of separation between powers. Well, here you have the idea of a strict separation of training, validation, and test data. And this is about methodological integrity, not about um, law. Of course, there's always curation and labeling, uh, often called, the, the curation is often called clean sing, which I find a very interesting term. Um, and of course, there is some sort of assumption that you have noise-free data. A lot of the theory, the methodological theory in computer science is based on noise-free data. A lot of experiments are done, prototypes built on the assumption of noise-free data. But of course, that does not exist. The question whether a data is noise or relevant information depends. It depends on who is trying to do what with that data and when. Now, one of the most interesting parts of machine learning is that what you're basically trying to find is a so-called target function. I'm just curious. Who has who can explain what is a target function in machine learning? Apart from the knowledgeable experts. Um, who has heard of a target function? Okay, okay. Work to be done, not for me, but for others. But I'm still going to try and quickly explain what is a target function. So, you have input data and output data. You have legal texts and you have judgments. So you're feeding the machine the legal texts and the facts and everything that you think is relevant for that judgment on the one hand and the judgments on the other hand. And you tell the system, I want you to make a connection between the two. Yeah. That connection is going to be the output. That's what is going to be considered in terms of accuracy. And that connection is a mathematical function. And it's actually not the target function because that is what we assume exists. It's the closest approximation of the target function. Now, I want you to to sit down and think about that. So we, we feed the system all this text, we do natural language processing, we do labeling, we do whatever, n-gram, word bags, blah, 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 blah. Hmm? And then the system begins to make connections between the text that we feed and the output. And at some point, we give it out of sample data, so we give it new texts, and then it begins to predict itself. Based on that mathematical function that it has approximated. That means that the assumption of machine learning is that underlying reality, there is a mathematical reality. I'm not saying that that mathematical reality causes what we do, but it's, it maps it or constitutes it or whatever. So there is a very interesting Neoplatonism that underlies machine learning, 
if you actually want to buy that. I think many data scientists that I know are simply very pragmatic. They say, well, I'm agnostic to that, whether that's the case or not. I just see that it does good predictions and I can work with that. But as lawyers, it is good to realize that we're basically assuming methodologically this mathematical reality. I didn't put the slide in, but there is a famous conversation between Stephen Hawking and Mark Zuckerberg. If you're very famous, you get to talk with each other online. And um, Hawkins asks Zuckerberg, what would you really like to find out? What would you really like to research or do or what? what? And then Mark Zuckerberg said, well, actually, I would like to know whether there is a fundamental mathematical law that underlies human intercourse behavior. Then he's silent for a minute and then he says, I bet there is. Now for me, that confirms that Mark Zuckerberg is not interested in money. He's not crazy, so he, will, he takes care of himself and his business. I mean, he lives in a market-driven uh, economy. But he's interested in us producing as much data as possible. Because if you want to find that law, data-driven, as a data-driven inference, you need the data. Hmm? OK. Summing up, on that first letter, experience E, we're talking about historical data, the training data and the validation set. What you basically would like to have is future data. Future data is always out of sample. You cannot train, validate, or test on future data. And that connects with mathematical insights uh, like Gödel's uh, theorem, and more specifically two words, um, machine learning, Wolpert's theorem. I will come back to that in the next slide if you can bear with me. The uncertainty that, for instance, machine learning, but also we, when we navigate the world, the uncertainty that we try to reduce by predicting things is basically inherent in the fact that we are temporal, that we are living in a temporal world, that future data never exist. There's a wonderful book by Elena Esposito. The title of the book is The Future of Futures. It was published in 2008. She wrote it just before the financial crisis. And always sum up her work like this. We have many present futures. We have all sorts of scenarios and predictions hmm? that are the present futures. We have only one future present. We have to be very careful with that future present because there's only one. But all those present futures are impacting the future present. The more complex the predictions and the more predictions, the more uncertainty we are generating. So the assumption that when you predict something, you reduce uncertainty, intuitively that is what most people would think. But founding father of, um, one of the founding fathers of cybernetics, Gabor, said it's exactly the opposite. Every time you predict, in the context of a human society, because people are going to respond to your prediction, you are creating more uncertainty. That uncertainty creates opportunities. Actually, that's where our freedom sits. You have three scenarios about the future. If you have no scenario about the future, I'm not sure what the meaning of freedom would be. But the point I'm making is that if you continue to aggregate data and to make more complex predictions, you're adding both to uncertainty and to complexity. You're adding an extra layer of complexity. Maybe it's unavoidable because there is no way we can actually analyze all the data that is now out there. But maybe we should start thinking about other ways of dealing with that um, 
complexity and uncertainty. The interesting thing, and I'm, I'm going to uh, keep this a bit short and move on. The, the interesting thing is that I talked about Shannon and that for Shannon information is compression. Now when you think about this target function, so imagine that you have three billiard data points and you can find a target function or an approximation of a target function in that data set. You have a very specific interest why you have collected those data. You have found that mathematical function and it has very high accuracy. Basically, that means you have compressed that data to one mathematical function. So instead of walking around with all that data on your back, you can now just walk around with that function. Yeah? That's interesting. What is even more interesting is that you could have compressed the same data, depending on other goals, other interests, in another way. Again, with high accuracy. So the same data set can always be compressed in different ways. Not in any way, not at all. One of the problems is that many of the ways you might compress them might be uh, spurious. So they might mean nothing. And there is a whole science now about uh, mathematically searching for when a correlation is a causation. Uh, Julia Pearl has just published the book of why, in which he has rewritten for a larger um, audience <coughs> his theory about causality. I just want you to remember, if you have all this data, you can compress it into a mathematical function that can ha have high accuracy. It does not mean that it's correct in what it says about the real world. That has to be seen, that has to be empirically tested also. But that same data set can be compressed differently. And that is very important for lawyers, because that is how you can contest. Let's skip Wolpert. You can um, um, I've put the site up. It's very interesting if you have this thing for mathematics. I'm going to be extremely brief on self-executing regulation or code-driven law, because um, in many ways that's something uh, 180 degree in the other direction. So data-driven is adaptive, responsive, it's learning, it's if new data comes in, the uh, function can be adapted, etc. While self-executing code is more in the form of if this, then that. So it's deterministic. That means in principle you can foresee the end decision. Though if the tree is very complex, then um, you might take some time before you understand that. So this is what people talk about in terms of smart regulation and smart contracts. It is now hyping as an affordance of blockchain, but it existed long before that. There have been a lot of attempts to develop self-executing code. Blockchain has some advantages that makes it easier, but it also has many disadvantages. Um, so you have to be very precise in when to use it. Now, the reason why I'm still uh, mentioning it here is because I think it will interact with data-driven law. So when you have a research design and you figure out an output, so in this case, you predict that outcome based on how you have trained your algorithm, then at some point you might get not the learning algorithm, the algorithm that has learned that output, but the algorithm that you can develop based on that output. And that algorithm could, for instance, be if there are this, these six data points, then this person is high risk, so he's not getting parole. He has to stay in prison. I'm thinking about the COMPASS uh, 
software that is used in many states in the United States uh, for parole decisions. Hmm? So they first have an algorithm to figure out how these data points connect, and then they have an output algorithm that is actually quite deterministic. That's why it's important to connect the two. Now, what does this mean for speaking law to statistics? I think if you use quantified legal prediction as a means to provide feedback to lawyers, to clients, to prosecutors, and to courts, it's extremely interesting Then you are enhancing the legal intelligence of the lawyers. If you use it as a sensitivity analysis, you're also doing business school, right? Is there anybody who knows what is sensitivity analysis? Can't be true. Sensitivity analysis. Okay, so it means that you, that you have figured out, for instance, that there are six data points that influence and get you to a certain outcome. But to know how the different weights of those six data points are, you shift the variable of one of them a little bit. You say, okay, I put a little bit more weight on that, or I remove it altogether. And then you look at the outcome. So that's a sensitivity analysis. This would be extremely interesting if you develop legal uh, quantitative legal prediction to start playing around with the different variables. Because as lawyers, you can learn from that. The system might tell you, well, if this defendant were 10 years older, probably he would be punished more. The system doesn't tell you why, but the system might tell you that. And that might make you think, oh, that's strange. That means when somebody gets older in these circumstances, so it, it teaches us things that we do not consciously think about. And I think that confrontation can be very good. Um, and it, in that sense, could also make decisions contestable again in a very practical way. So if quantified legal prediction is a domain for experimentation, for developing new insights, for detecting argumentation patterns that we do not consciously apply, but that seem to be in the text because the system got them there, detected them there. And of course, the testing of alternative approaches, so that's like the sensitivity analysis. It could detect missing information, both facts and legal arguments. It could help to improve the outcome of actual cases. And of course, the idea is that it can be used to improve the acuity of human judgment. I am absolutely sure that it will very often just be a way to be more efficient, to have less labor and more products, more tools. That means it is used to replace human judgment. And I think that in itself, there is nothing wrong with that. We have to think about it and talk about it and look at the implications. But it basically means that if you outsource decisions, and that can also be all sorts of decisions that are taken in the backend system that give you an output that you sort of automatically begin to follow, because that's how humans work. We should never confuse artificial legal intelligence with law. I would say it's administration, it's legal tech, it's an instrument. Um, now, I have developed quite some time ago the concept of legal protection by design, starting from the fact this was not yet about computational law, that our whole environment is changing in a data, into a data-driven environment. We are becoming data engines, and my position is that you cannot rule that environment by a text-driven law alone. It's simply not possible. You will have to start 
the law will have to start interacting with these systems. Legal protection by design would mean that you figure out how these environments actually diminish legal protection. Not purposively, but as a side effect. Let's assume that. Legal protection by design means that you require legally that the architectures that have such an effect are engineered in such a way that they compensate against that. After I developed that concept, I now see concepts like legal by design um, and even the concept legal design. So I think it's interesting to uh, possession the legal protection by design uh, in comparison to do these two concepts. So um, this is legal design. Um, and the idea here is uh, from the legal design lab, which is connected with Stanford, um, looks uh, extremely interesting. The idea is that you're building tools, you're doing some sort of creative invention um, based on an engineering approach to the law. I think that's extremely interesting and extremely important, especially that lawyers start doing that with their background and understanding of what makes law law. And I also think it is fun. Legal by design basically means that you design a system, that you architect a system for compliance. So you could say this is about either default compliance, that people can still change something in the system, thereby not compliance, but that default, they will comply. And in certain circumstances, you could even technically rule out non-compliance. Uh, this is also about smart regulation, so developing self-executing regulation uh, uh, comparable to self-executing contracts. Uh, you could do that via a distributed ledger. I'm not sure whether the disadvantages do not overrule the advantages there, but there are other techniques to um, accomplish that. So the computer science perspective would be that this is code-driven regulation. Now, what's the difference between legal by design and legal protection by design? This is connected with the idea that law should be technologically, uh, technology neutral. The European Commission, in nearly all its uh, output, says that law should be technically neutral. And when you analyze uh, those reports, you see that there are three reasons given for that. The first is that we don't want to stand in the way of innovation. If we're going to be technically specific, then we might rule out certain innovations, and that is precisely not what we want to do. The second is we want law to be sustainable. We don't want to sustain, to change the law Basically, if you're talking about acts of parliament or directives or regulation, they take time to make. So we want the right level of abstraction that not every time that a new technology develops, we need new legislation. There is a third objective of technology neutral law, and that is compensation. Sometimes when the technological environment we live in changes, the protection that the law offers changes, simply because the environment is not the same. So if we say we have a right to privacy, and the environment develops interfaces that have a choice architecture meant to make us produce as much personal data as possible, with very little idea of what happens in the secondary, tertiary, and usage of that data and how it will 
backfire on us based on inferences made, hmm? then you could say, well, it's nice to say that we have a right to privacy, but we have to, and this might sound counterintuitive, but we have to now make technology-specific law in order to make sure that law remains technology neutral. If we don't do that, then we're fooling ourselves. We say, yeah, but in the law it says that this text-driven law, there is these words, privacy, right to privacy. Ha ha, doesn't work. So to keep law technology neutral means it can't be true that just because the technological environment changes, that what we agreed upon as a democracy has to be protected is suddenly eradicated. We don't want that. If we want to do away with privacy to some extent, we'll have to sit down and talk about that. That discussion should not be in the boardrooms or with the technology developers. That's not their task. So the rule of law forms an architecture, a very specific architecture. I teach law to computer scientists, master students of computer science. My experience is that they understand what is law often better than my law students did. Why? Because they think in terms of architecture, complexity, multidimensionality. So if I say, look, if a court decides to make a small change here, then it will ripple through the whole architecture. And that is what the court has to think about. If I say that to computer scientists, they say, yeah, what else is new? If you're building a system, you're used to that. Anything you do ripples through the architecture. But lawyers are used to text that's linear. That's another way of processing information. But the law is a very complex system. So when you think about what you're actually doing, doing as a lawyer, is interacting with that complexity. Now, that architecture of the law under the rule of law, which is something that has developed over the past, um, let's say, three, 300 years, it's a historical artifact, it's not given, we can just give it away if we don't watch out. It basically says that the rules that we make to achieve something, so these rules are instrumental, they are functional, they have a certain aim, they're policy, they come from policy, they are always functional in a way that also offers legal protection. So these rules of law are both constitutive and regulative, limitative. So they give a competence to the state to punish people, public punishment, but they immediately, in the same flow, constrict that. That means legal protection by design. And I'm now not talking about legal by design, but legal protection by design. There are three conditions. That technical articulation must be initiated by the democratic legislator, or must be, in another way, democratically legitimated, because that is what we agreed on as our uh, jurisdiction, as our system. I'm sure there are people who say, well, let's throw democracy out. There are also people who say, let's throw the rule of law out. Um, I'm not one of these people, and I think it's a very precious and vulnerable, fragile institution that we still have, and it needs maintenance. So if you want to do legal protection by design, this is not something that, that some engineers and lawyers can sit down and do. It's the legislator that will have to put its mind to that and see how far-reaching the implications are. The idea of democratic government under the rule of law is always default, make government transparent, keep citizens opaque. There are many exceptions to that, but they have to be justified. This is the default. And the third very important condition is that any norm that is going to, legal norm, sorry, 
that is going to be applied, definitely if it's automatically applied, must be contestable. As the court in Strasbourg would say, you must have an effective and practical remedy. This is not about theory, this is about getting law done. Last example of what it would mean for machine learning, also relevant for uh, artificial legal intelligence. And I'm going to quote an article by uh, Hoffman, Sharma, and Watts, Duncan Watts, who invented the science of networks, or one of the founding fathers. Um, and they wrote an article on interpretation and prediction. Basically, the idea of the article is that science and the humanities and social science traditionally are focused on interpretation, and they should move more towards prediction. I started fleshing out that article doing close reading of that article, because I wanted to refute that argument. But then, when I was reading it, I got impressed with the argument, a specific part of the argument. So they discriminate between two phases of machine learning, exploratory and confirmatory. And then they say, and I'm now quoting, exploratory machine learning researchers are free to study different tasks fit multiple models, try various exclusion rules, and test on multiple performance metrics. So here we are playing around, figuring out what happens if I do this. Ah, but what if I take that extra data? Oh, okay, I test on six performance metrics. What does it say? Ah, okay. But then they say, and this is important. Oh, yeah, sorry. When they do exploratory machine learning, they should when they report their findings, so publish, be transparent about the full sequence of design choices to avoid creating the false impression of having confirmed a hypothesis rather than simply having generated one. And this is two very different things. And of course, Chris Anderson wrote an article in Wired saying that we are now at the end of theory, but I'm afraid that no serious data scientist will agree with Chris Anderson. So it's very important to know the difference between a correlation, an explanation, and a causation. So here we are talking about design decisions, and I think this is much more important than this explanation of what happens in the system. I want to know how this machine learning contraption was developed. What decisions did you make? Which were the trade-offs? Because then we can have an interesting conversation. Then, um, yes, etc. Then he moves on towards confirmatory machine learning. And then he becomes more strict. He says researchers should be required to pre-register their research design. In medical science, this is normal. If you do not pre-register your research design, no serious journal is going to publish. Why? Because of p-hacking, etc. This should become the norm in machine learning, including pre-processing choices, model specifications, evaluation metrics, P, out-of-sample predictions. And they basically say this should be done in an open forum. So we're not talking about stuff that is protected by intellectual property or trade secret. We're just saying if you want to uh, convince us that, that this is a reliable algorithm that you have produced or application of machine learning, we want to see how you did it. Um, I'm, I'm now arguing that in the context of the European Union, the machine directive is now in consultation uh, because they want to bring robotics and the Internet of Things, a combination of AI and robotics and Internet of Things under the machine directive. So the little CE labels that you see on toys and other stuff uh, there is somebody within the EU that is watching that, uh, you know, the pan you fry your egg in doesn't uh, explode in your face. That's the CE label. So my proposal would be 
require that anybody who puts on the market a machine learning application has to have pre-registered this with an emphasis on pre, not after you finished put something together that you then afterwards say was your research design, because then we can't check whether it is serious business. Okay, this means that data-driven legal intelligence will require a new hermeneutics. That means we're going to have to do close reading of the results of distant reading, and then probably we're not talking about text, but about graphs, etc. We'll have to decipher the output algorithms based on their research design. And that way, we should be able to develop a contestable division of tasks between text-driven, data-driven, and code-driven law. And you wouldn't believe it, but there is an end even to this presentation. First of all, th thank you for being with us. Thank you for um, a deep dive into um, some of the critical points. It doesn't come as a surprise that, um, as a quantitative legal scholar, I would have one or two reservations about it. Um, but I think the general level of what we've been, what we've been seeing, that's the great thing, right? We want a full picture here, and um, you provide a very full picture for that. So thanks for that. We have some food for thought, and we have a pen for more of these ideas. Thank you, Mireille. Thank you very much. <laughs>